Hi, we're coming live to you from the Exploratorium in San Francisco. I'm Kate O'Donnell, and welcome to this special webcast with the EV Nautilus, which is a ship over 3,000 miles away, exploring off the coast of the Galapagos Islands, off the coast of Ecuador. I want to welcome the studio audience here in the Exploratorium and live out on the web. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the audience here at the Exploratorium a little bit later on in the show, uh, but in the meantime, uh, so Darwin was the first geologist to visit the Galapagos, but for him, much of the islands were out of view underwater. So today we're going to be connecting with it live with a ship that has been exploring around the Galapagos Islands. Uh, the EV Nautilus has been exploring the sea around them, um, looking at hydrothermal vents and seamounts and more. So we're going to be going first to the Inner Space Center in Rhode Island, who will be connecting us live with the ship. I think that we are almost ready to be connected now with Emily at the Inner Space Center in just a moment. So um, Emily, do we have you? Hi guys, this is Emily at the Inner Space Center. Yes, I can hear you. How's everyone doing today? We're great. How are you? We're, I'm awesome. Uh, we are here at the uh, University of Rhode Island and I'm very excited. When the, I'm going to be sending you over to the EV Nautilus. We have a couple of our members of the Corps of Exploration who are going to answer all of your questions. So I'm going to send it over to them. Great. Thanks. Hello, everyone in the Exploratorium. Hello, hello. Hello. So Chuck and Rachel, could you introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, also what the ship is up to right now? Mm. Yes, certainly. So the ship, we are just heading to our next dive site. We'll be diving on the side of a seamount near the Isle of Darwin, which will be very exciting. We plan to look for lots of new life forms and, well, new, new lots of exciting examples of bio, biology. And also have a look at the geological features here. But to introduce ourselves, my name is Rachel Rayner. I'm a science communicator from Australia. And here I have with me the very important man, Chuck Fisher, who's very important to the expedition today. Hi, my name is Chuck Fisher. I'm a professor of biology at Penn State University. I'm a deep sea biologist and co-lead of this expedition. Great. So you've been exploring a pretty special place. Um, the Galapagos has, of course, been home to a couple really landmark discoveries about how we understand life um, beyond Darwin. The discovery of hydrothermal vents in the 1970s uh, was also paired with a pretty amazing discovery about just what and where life can be. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that discovery in 1977? What were scientists looking for and what did they find? Yeah, certainly. So what they were looking for was actually uh, um, to, a, a way to prove plate tectonics. So of course, as you may be familiar with, our Earth is covered in lots of plates that move around, which is how our continents move around the Earth. And so this was a, a, a new, relatively new theory in the 1970s, and they were still looking for proof that this is exactly how our Earth worked. So they were heading to the Galapagos Rift to see there's two plates that are moving apart there, and they wanted to check whether this was uh, congruent with theories, with mathematical theories of, of uh, how this system would work. So they were looking for a temp temperature anomaly down there, a, a figure to, to make the math fit with what was really observed. So one of the really interesting parts about that expedition is that no biologists went along. They were invited, but they really didn't expect <laughs> to find anything interesting. What they expected to find was new sea floor and really not much life on it because very little food makes it to the sea floor. But of course, that's not what they found. What they found were these oases of life with giant tube worms and giant mussels and clams and very high densities all around the pools of warm water issuing from the center of the earth. So yeah, Chuck, as you said, um, it, was, it was so unexpected that there would be life around the vents that there weren't biologists on board. How, how deep are hydrothermal vents and how hot is the water around them and why was finding life around them such a surprise? Sure. So the vents are about a mile and a half deep in that area. and The water emerges from the seafloor at a wide range of temperatures anywhere from just barely above ambient, and ambient temperature in the deep sea is, at, in this area, is about two degrees centigrade ice water, and it emerges right up to 
three or four times the temperature at which water would boil on the surface of the planet, 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the life is usually found around the diffuse flow, areas where the temperatures are kind of what we'd find on a hot day at home, anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 degrees centigrade, 50 to 80, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the life that's there is based on a completely different completely different food chain. I mean, here on the surface of the planet, all life as we know it, all animals, ultimately get their nutrition from green plants. And green plants grow from the energy and sunlight by the process called photosynthesis. However, there around hydrothermal vents, there's water coming up from, from, almost, from deep under the, the surface of the ocean. It's rich in reduced chemicals and there's special bacteria down there that can oxidize those chemicals and harness the energy and grow and make food for all the animals. The process is called chemosynthesis, and that is the basis of the food chain at the hydrothermal vents, not the photosynthesis that we see here on the surface of the planet. So what does a typical community around a vent look like? And can you tell how old it is based on what's there? So a typical community around a vent depends on where in the world you are. There's spreading centers all over the planet, and in different parts of the globe, you'll find different types of communities. Now, here on the Galapagos Rift, the typical community consists of giant tube worms, fossils that can be almost a foot long, and clams that can be even bigger. And yet, you can take a pretty good guess at the age of a vent by the biology that's there. The first Big animals that settle at new vents are tube worms. Of course, they start out small, but within a year or two, they can be three feet long or more, and slowly muscles will move in. After five to 10 years, the muscles will actually choke out the tube worms, they're the only thing that's left behind. Now, the whole time clams may be settling around the, around the edges, you find big clams you know, approaching a foot long. You know you've got an even older vent, maybe 15 or 20 years old. And that's an old vent for this part of the world, where the average lifespan of an active vent is only about 10 years till another volcanic eruption or earthquake changes the flow and a new vent starts up somewhere else. What were some of the broader discoveries of the vents for ocean science and for understanding where else life can live? So, Certainly for you know, geoscience, the discovery of the vents and, and further analysis proved what was then a theory of plate tectonics. For biology, it really made us rethink life at some level, and certainly life in the deep sea, where we thought all of the deep sea would be poor in animal life and low density. We now know that areas where chemosynthesis can occur, you can have abundant life. In fact, after the chemosynthesis and the symbiosis of those bacteria living inside some of the animals at the vents was first discovered at vents. We reevaluated a number of shallow water environments and found the same thing worms with symbionts, clams with symbionts, et cetera. So it really was one of the, one of the big discoveries that changes the way we think about the ocean in general and the deep sea especially. And so the ship recently revisited some of the first uh, hydrothermal vent sites that were discovered. That must have been pretty exciting. What did you find? Yeah, so we found that that original site that uh, Dr. Bob Ballard and his team had discovered in 1977 had been paved over. So uh, the lava flow had, there'd been an eruption and it had paved over that site. So it was no longer, but uh, they uh, looked around, they found some other new sites as well. So these sites are ephemeral. They don't last very long. Uh, as um, Chuck said, about 10 years is the average lifespan, but they did find others further along. So we know that this life will find another vent and start, uh, begin again there. So uh, it was really exciting to go down and see these things. I know there's a little bit of disappointment that the original site was no longer there, but it was really exciting to see other ones in a, in a newer stage of life. Yeah, I think we were some disappointment, but not really unexpected, because <laughs> yes. we didn't think it would have lasted quite this long. So was it surprising that they were paved over? Um, does it mean that there were a lot more new vent sites nearby? Well, no, I think that, uh, I think we'd expected that it would, 
that have changed. In fact, they even looked about 10 years ago and couldn't find it. They found another new fence site close by the original site at Rose Garden, which they nicknamed Rosebud, but even that site was paved over. So we had uh, visited a site that was um, about 10 miles away from that, where there was active venting and found the luxurious communities that uh, we've come to expect for this region. And we did a little exploration and found yet another vent site that had a active smoker at it. And for the first time ever, we saw the types of animals that are found on smokers in nearby parts of the world, but we found them for the first time ever on the Galapagos Rift. So that was very exciting. Yeah. And if you want to see these for yourself and, and share them with your friends and family, visit our website, the NautilusLive.org website. We have highlight videos there. So there is a video of us first coming across those tube worms at the Tempest Student site, and it really was a fantastic moment. So, yeah, share that video with all your friends and be part of the exploration here. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so you've been exploring the Galapagos for a few weeks now. Can you just tell us a little bit about the difference between a ship for exploration versus a traditional research vessel? You want to try that one? Yeah, all right, I'll try that. So um, a typical research vessel, it goes out to test a hypothesis. So they already have an idea of what they're going to find down there, and they want to go check it out and make sure their hypothesis is correct. But we're an exploration video uh, vessel, which means that we don't know what we're going to find. We're having a look to see uh, what, what might be down there. We don't really know. So we are definitely exploring. We're seeing places that have not been seen by human eyes before. So yeah, it's a little bit more of the exploration. And yeah. then the research comes after. We'll take samples as we're exploring and then bring them up. And then they get logged and catalogued and sent to universities around the world. And of course, you can join in as well. So we do live stream. So it's explorative because you're there with us. You can explore alongside us too. I want to see if any of our audience members have any questions for you. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yes. So if the vents only last 10 years, how do the crabs get from one vent to the next vent? Oh, good question. Yeah. So it it depends on how far away the vent is. I mean, sometimes a vent site will stop and a new one can start up just meters away. And if they're close enough, the adult crabs can walk over to the new vent site, and, and they will. But oftentimes, a new vent site's born, they can be tens or hundreds of miles away from any other vent site. And then all of the animals that get to that vent site come there in larval form. Most of these animals will make eggs that develop into a, a larval form, much like there's a difference between a butterfly and a caterpillar. But in this case, it's the larval forms that disperse. It's the little babies that swim up into the water column and find a new vent site where they'll settle down and metamorphose into the adult form that will either crawl around or, or grow up attached at the new vent site. So hopefully that answers your question. Do we have another one? Do you have other questions? Okay. Um, I have a question about what you've been doing recently. Uh, you were exploring seamounts, I think, today and yesterday. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been seeing and finding? Yeah, I think I'll throw this one to Chuck because we made some really amazing, uh, had some really amazing sightings in the past two days. So it's been great. We're, we're diving on seamounts that have not been dove on before. They're not even named. They're part of the new um, Galapagos Marine Reserve. And our goal here is to explore and just document what's down there. We found a uh, new species of fish within minutes of hitting our first um, vent site. It's a very cute little bat fish, never before been seen in this part of the world. We also found what we think might be a whole new group of sponges. It was unlike anything I've ever seen before or any of our experts at shore have ever seen before. We've had great dives. Our last one was on a... Uh, a sea mount that in the last few minutes when they reached the crest, they found hydrothermal venting. Now this time it's not coming from a spreading center, but rather it was an undersea volcano coming from the hot spot. We'd just begun to explore it. When we had a leak in the hydraulic arm, we had to come to the surface. So I really hope we get a chance to go back down and see what's there, because this is a really exciting find to have a, an undersea volcano that's active with the potential of vent life this close to the ridge something we've never seen before. It's a great, fantastic question. Do we have another quick one? Sure. 
Um, what's the ROV like? I mean, is it manned or is it, how does it work? Um, yeah, so you might be able to just see over our shoulder one of the ROVs. So we've got two ROVs, Hercules and Argus. Hercules goes in the water first. He's our uh, main main guy down there. He's got a uh, very fantastically movable arm so he can grab samples and lots of sample box on him that he can store those samples. And even a slurper so he can slurp up those smaller samples like the worms and things that we were looking at yesterday and sponges, of course. Uh, so he's the main one. Lots of high-definition cameras on him as well because the scientists are always taking pictures. Oh, that's one of the biggest steps mm. in identifying these species. There's lots of photos of them in their natural habitat. And we have scientists on land that are watching in as well, so they get to see those photos and help us with identification as we go. And then behind us, we've got Argus, who's a little bit smaller, and he's a little bit heavier, and he sits above Hercules. He's our eyes in the sky. And he also bobs with the ship so that Hercules down the bottom can stay nice and still, because he needs to be very still to be able to do all the fine movements that he's there to do. So Argus is a little bit heavier and bobbing with the ship, and then looks down on Hercules, so we can keep an eye on Hercules from above. And we got some great images from Argus and Hercules together when we encountered the sperm whale back in the Gulf of Mexico. So they're both very important and there's no people down there. These ROVs can stay down for, I think the maximum they've been down there is about three days. And then we rotate our watch schedules. So rather than being up for 24 hours at a time, we have a team that rotates through. So you can... Yeah. And not only can we take turns watching what's happening on the seafloor, but it's all broadcast live at the same time, so you can tune in at www.nautiluslive.org and see what's happening in real time, just yeah. like we are. And Help us out. Ask your questions or, or uh, give us a little insight. Yeah, we really appreciate them. It's fantastic, especially in the middle of the night. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think we're seeing your website now. Yeah, the video of the sperm whale is uh, pretty Thank amazing. You. It was a pleasure. <laughs> um, I think I, I have one last question for you. Um, okay. Oh, we're saying goodbye. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, so now that you have been in the Galapagos for a few weeks exploring, if you had to go back to investigate a particular question, do you have one um, that is of particular interest that you would go back to explore further? <laughs> oh, um, I, I don't know. I, I'd yeah. love to go back and see those tube worms again and see the spreading centers. And I loved seeing those giant rifts in the ground, the, the fissures and the chasms that have opened up in that surface in the Galapagos Rift. I'd love to have a sneak peek down those rifts to see what's down in the bottom of them. That's something I'd like to do. I don't know if Argus and Hercules are the, the guys to do it, but that would be pretty well, cool. You know, if I could do anything right now, I'd go right back to where we ended our dive last night and do a little more exploring up on top of that seamount and see what we might find around that volcanic activity. But we're on a tight schedule. We're going to dive on a new seamount in just a few hours, and who knows? We may find something even more exciting there. So join along with us at nautiluslive.org. Send us in your questions. Say hi to the team. We'd love to have you all there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chuck and Rachel. And uh... Exploratorium, thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to go to our website, nautiluslive.org, to follow us all season long. And make sure to check those dive updates on Facebook and Twitter. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Hi. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much to our audience uh, online and everyone here in the studio. Uh, and thank you to Nautilus Live. These webcasts are made possible by the Oak Meadow Foundation. Please join us uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. here at the Exploratorium or on Explo.tv as we connect again with the Nautilus uh, for another special webcast. Thanks. <laughs>